We have a new Payware fighter jet in Microsoft Flight Sim. We have the F-22A by Top Mac Studios. In today's video, I'll be reviewing this brand new fighter jet. Let's get right into it. Okay, so as you can see, it's the F-22, of course, a very versatile, albeit highly secretive, aircraft operated solely by the USAF. Now, we are sitting here on the ground in Florida, although you'll see this aircraft be put through its paces throughout the world in today's video. A little bit of background about the F-22. The variant you get in this package is the F-22A. Top Mac Studios have released this on their website and on some online vendors such as Just Flight, which is where I bought it from. It should be coming to Xbox and will be available via the Marketplace. The one limitation of the Marketplace option is that you won't see any weapons, so when it comes to Xbox, you probably won't be able to open the bomb bay doors and see your missiles and bombs in there, like you'll be able to see in this video. You can pick this up for around £25, I've put more accurate pricing information in the description down below, along with some of the links to the online vendors. It hasn't reached the Marketplace yet, but I imagine it will be there in a few days or weeks time. A little bit of background about the F-22 in real life. It first flew in 1997, but is still a highly modern air superiority fighter. The US Air Force originally envisioned to pick up 750 of these bad boys, but the program was cut short, meaning only 187 aircraft reached the flight line. It is a highly versatile aircraft. In most part due to the fact it's got something called thrust vectoring, which allows the aircraft to be incredibly manoeuvrable at low speeds, close to stall speed, you'll see it in this video today. Top Mag Studios themselves of course released a freeware version of this aircraft that you can also pick up with a link in the description. This one is highly advanced compared to that one, with more custom systems in place, a better external model, Better sounds, everything has been improved from that version. But is it worth it? Well, at £25, I'll be giving you my verdict at the end. Without further delay, I think we've spoken enough about the aircraft. Let's get right into it. Okay, so while we're outside, we might as well take the opportunity to look at the external model of it before heading into the cockpit and then swapping over to RAF Lakenheath to have a look at how it flies. As you can see, externally, it is pretty well detailed. It's not perfect, but it's certainly payware level, it's what I'd expect. Things like engine covers, removed before flight tags, and chocks, albeit becoming increasingly commonplace in payware aircraft and freeware aircraft for that matter, are always a nice touch, and of course, the custom tow bar is nice as well. This aircraft is incredibly aerodynamic, so there's not too many things sticking out but what does stick out has been modelled well. Texture quality is also pretty good, you do have to get quite close, unrealistically close, to see its imperfections, like here. Realistically, you're going to be looking, at best, this close to the aircraft, so while getting up close to show that it's not perfect in all areas, you're not going to be getting this close. You also get a good view of the incredibly unique Pratt & Whitney F119 PW100 turbofan engines at the end, which of course are equipped with an afterburner. Now, if you want to use your afterburner, of course you'll need to assign it in settings. All in all, external model highlights this unique aircraft in an acceptable manner. It's very nice, it could be improved in some areas, I would say but certainly good value for money. You do, of course, you do get two liveries as well, which is a nice touch, and there is actually two variants in the menu, as you can see. One with fly-by-wire controls, which is realistic to real life, and then the other one without fly-by-wire controls, which I don't believe exists in real life, but it's for those that want a more authentic flight experience without feeling impeded by the electronics. How does it fly? Well, startup is really easy. You know, it's a few buttons. I don't imagine it's that easy in real life, but who knows, it might be. I'm not an F-22 pilot, but I think in the startup checklist, there was like six to eight things to do. Very, very easy. You can just hop in, click a few buttons, and you can be up in the air. 
The checklist works, although there's some things where you click the I button and they don't actually show up. That might be because they're actually inside some of the pages on the primary flight displays or secondary flight displays. For example, engine pumps, I find to turn those on, you do actually need to head to the fuel page as opposed to any physical switch. So do bear that in mind, but of course, a manual has been included. Back here at Florida, although you did see a startup there, let me just go through it here. So to get rid of all the stuff like ladders or whatever, you basically need to come to, let me just go from the start, you need to come to the menu and then click config, the bottom left corner, sim, and then you've got all the selection menu here. To take off chocks, click that. To take off remove before flight tags, click remove before flight tags, take away the ladder, click the ladder, everything else can go away. To close the canopy, although of course we'd start the engines normally before, you want to come over to the right and click canopy switch, and you want to click this switch just under it and the canopy will close. Now as you've already seen on my other startup when I was talking about systems, it is a really easy aircraft to start up. So we've got a battery on, we can come down to the left here in the throttle quadrant, turn APU on, monitor it with the engine switch here. Click control up here and then you can see our APU is at 100% now. Now we can turn on our fuel pumps. I don't believe this is the right way to do it like exactly after. Normally do a bit of waiting. Click ignition. Let's just do engine number one first. And then click start. Look at that, we've got some smoke. It's awesome. Oh yeah, look at that. This is why it's payware. You don't get any of that with freeware. You also notice our APU sticking out there. That's that funny little thing. I had no clue what it was when I first looked at it. On top of the port side wing looks awesome. Really, really nice attention to detail there. You can also see the heat blur from the engine, which is normal, quite expected. And you can see our flight controls evening out. I do apologise for my lights, I think that's a conflict with my honeycomb panel, so I'll try and turn those off. And I'm going to start into number two. So ignoring my lights, which is a conflict with my honeycomb panel, you can see it's a really easy aircraft to get going. How does it fly? Well, up in the air, it's quite the dream. Now, I've got experience with the fly-by-wire version. I keep saying fly-by-wire. Don't get confused with the fly-by-wire A320. They're unrelated. Fly-by-wire is the system of the flight controls being controlled electronically via electric or digital signals as opposed to pulleys and levers and that kind of thing. Don't get confused there. Most of you will know that, of course, but if you're new to flight simulation or aviation in general, you might not know that, so please don't confuse the two. It takes off really nicely, enabling afterburners, you can get up really, really quickly. Of course, it flies supersonically, and you don't actually need afterburners to get there. In addition to that, and I'll speak about it more in a minute, particle effects are awesome, from breaking the sound barrier to, of course, the smoke we've seen. It's all very good. From the outside, it looks awesome. Now, thrust vectoring. I don't know if I've been doing it right, but I believe it's all automatic. I can't find any button to enable it, so I'm imagining it's all automatic. And certainly, I find when flying at slow speeds, there's a bit of a help from the back. Compared to other aircraft where you'd stall and fall to the ground, you can manage quite well at 150, 100 knots. High up in the air, even lower if you're lucky. Of course, you can go right down to double digits, really. I haven't tried single digits, I don't think I'm that brave. But you can go really low in terms of speed and retain a lot of control. I think that's important. That's what thrust vectoring is. That's what makes this such a wonderfully manoeuvrable aircraft in real life. I really do enjoy it. Landing is a different story for me. I uh, have yet to do a decent landing. I got an acceptable landing where I did rip off the gear eventually on my third attempt coming into Norwich. I always find fighter jets a wonderful joy to land. They are quite difficult in my opinion, especially when you're used to airliners, which might explain my very steep flare. Now one thing I haven't talked about in this video is sound. Sound is really good. In my opinion, it's probably one of the main selling points. You know, all the buttons have sounds, there's individual, I mean like when we were starting up, when the smoke came out you could hear it, it was really cool, I haven't really seen anything like that properly with any fighter jet in Microsoft Flight Sim, so that's certainly a plus point. There are a few negatives, in my opinion some of it hasn't been finished as well, some textures in the cockpit could do with a bit of work. And of course I do think system depth compared to the real life F-22 does lack a bit. But equally, I'm not an F-22 pilot, so it might be what it's like in real life. 
but I would imagine there's more to it. Stuff like radar, of course, we haven't really got in Microsoft Flow Sim, so I guess we can't necessarily ask for it, and it's not going to work like DCS level anyway. You haven't got weapons, so you can't lock onto anyone. You can open your Bombay doors to see weapons, but that's, but that's about as far as it goes. In terms of autopilot, it does exist. It's quite jolty in my opinion and I'm yet to use it properly to be honest with fly by wire aircraft of this regard. You're not going to be sitting on autopilot unless you're going for really long uh, sorties across down to South Italy from RAF Lakenheath or RAF Mildenhall if you're in the UK and flying for the USAF. That's about it really. All in all it's a pretty nice aircraft to fly. It's really fun to use the thrust vector and go really slow and yet retain some really good control, it's really interesting. Let's head back to Florida now, I think I've spoken in every detail pretty well. We're ready to taxi away now, so let's taxi. That's one thing I didn't say, this aircraft doesn't seem to have any resistance, as soon as you release the parking brake, you're ready to go with taxiing. I mean I imagine the engines are pretty powerful, so that would make sense, but it does feel pretty awesome. I'd also like to see a few more bumps when you're taxiing along, you can see some at times, but it's nowhere near the level you'd expect in a pretty small aircraft in comparison. As you've seen throughout this video, the heads up display is pretty good, you know, can't complain with that. We're just going to fly right onto the runway, or taxi right onto the runway I should say, and go from there. I really do like it, I would recommend it, I'd probably give it a final rating of 7.5 out of 10. Fighter jets in Microsoft Flight Sim, I can't lie, are an acquired taste. They're certainly not for everyone, and I can see why people don't like them, okay? You're taking out a big part of flying a fighter jet. No weapons, no radar, nothing like that. Very rudimental systems. You know, from the maps down here, you can see they're more Microsoft Flight Sim modelled systems as opposed to F-22 modelled systems. That's not a problem if you like it, if you don't mind it then it's perfectly acceptable but if you're going in expecting a fully fledged DCS level, study level, F-22 then don't go in with that 4 because that will leave you disappointed in my opinion anyway. Sounds are beautiful, external model is beautiful, cockpit is certainly acceptable. System depth isn't too in depth, but it's to be expected, it's Microsoft Flight Sim. It makes a big upgrade from the freeware version, but does that justify the UK pound cost? Well, I think if this is your cup of tea, then yes. But if you're going in expecting anything else than a Microsoft Flight Sim fighter jet, then maybe reconsider. It's very nice. It is very nice. But it's still a fighter jet in Microsoft Flight Sim, and I think that requires a different type of pilot. And if you're really into your fighter jets, then I'd probably say, this isn't necessarily for you. This is clearly made to be used for fun, which I think is a perfectly good thing, of course, I have great fun flying it. But you're not going to be able to fly to DCS level, and that's just the way Microsoft Flight Sim is. And to be perfectly honest, it's what they intended. They say it right at the top of the manual and all over the description pages. They want it to be as realistic as possible, but you've got to understand there's Microsoft Flight Sim limits. I think that's important to remember. I'm actually going to change my final rating from 7.5 to 8.5. I thought about it, and I think 7.5 was a bit too low. I think 8.5 hits it well. Certainly very good. It's great fun. There's some improvements to make though. I think that wraps it up pretty well for me today, that is all. Thank you so much for watching, let's take off here from Florida, afterburners on, bye bye. Before I take off I realise I've just left my OPU on which is a pretty embarrassing end to the video. Not that it would actually do anything uh, to the sim but I imagine it would be pretty bad in real life but you can see it's now gone. On that bombshell, have a great day, bye bye.